Welcome everybody to today's lunch seminar, which is uh, entitled Higher Education for the Elite or for Everyone. And this is the second seminar in the series called Gothenburg Democracy Talks, which is organized by the International Youth Think Tank, IYTT as we call it in abbreviation. My name is Urban Stamberg. I am the co-founder and managing director of the IYTT. The IYTT is an organization which is mobilizing young persons, basically from all over the world, to stand up for democracy in times when someone needs to stand up for democracy. And our young people do that by summoning for conferences and producing tangible proposals for making the world a little bit more democratic. And uh, there are different ways of doing that. Today, we are focused on, uh, on a specific a prerequisite for a democratic world, and that is about education. So, you know, education is not uh, immediately for everyone. Some may feel excluded. Some may don't have the, the opportunities for getting themselves education. So that is the issue of today. How could more people uh, be given the chance of studying at universities? And what you will have today is first three different presentations. Uh, and then you will have a commentator's panel who will give some comments on the presentations. And by the end, we will have an open Q&A uh, session so that you in the room and you who are online could come in with comments and questions. So this is the way we will run today. Very welcome once again. And the first presenter I welcome up here now, and it is Erik Toshak. Erik Toshak is a, has a master's degree in the history of, uh, of IDs. He's also hired by the International Youth Think Tank as an assistant fellow. And he will now pr present to you the results and the, the background for a recent working paper that he has been written with the title Widening Participation and Career Guidance, Filling Quotas or Enabling and Empowering. Please, Erik. Thank you, Urban. <clears throat> Many of you have heard the story, perhaps, about the Sputnik crisis, uh, which is represented by this uh, lovely postcard, the Soviet postcard from 57. Uh, so the Soviets, they sent the first man-made objects into space, thereby challenging the American self-image of being the greatest nation in the world. Among other things, this led to a huge uh, rise in public expenditure on education which in a few years made the American people the most educated in the world, which in turn helped build an unprecedented economic growth. The rest of the Western world followed uh, the example of the US. This was quite some time ago though, as you can see. Uh, so if we believe uh, Thomas Pitkitty, which was interviewed earlier this week in the Swedish leading newspaper, Dagens Nyheter, uh, expenditures for education has been pretty much on the same level since then. Uh, while at the same time the student population has been steadily increasing. This means a race in the quantity of education, but with a corresponding decline in the quality in large parts of the education system. Uh, widening participation in higher education, that is making qualitative education widely and equally available to, to everyone, is not only a requirement for economic growth though, we would also argue that it is essential for democracy. So the latest uh, uh, Global State of Democracy report from our friends at the International IDEA, which I strongly recommend you to read, uh, clearly states that democratic systems and democratic ideas are retreating worldwide. As a major factor in this development, the IDEA points to the increased social and economic inequalities that feed uh, political polarization. Basically, inequality is pulling our democracies apart. Equalizing education uh, can be a very powerful tool in combating this development. Decision makers at the highest level are quite aware of both the economic and democratic importance of widening participation. The European Higher Education Area, which is an extension of the Bologna process, very much recognizes the importance of making higher education accessible to a broader spectrum of the population. For every policy document that they have published over the last 20 years, 
the theme of widening participation has become increasingly prominent. In the 2020 Rome communique, inclusiveness is presented as the very first watchword defining the goals of the European higher education area. So how are these fine ideals realized in Europe today? This is where things become a bit problematic. My overview concludes that policymakers pretty much leave the implementation of these goals to the universities. But while universities are given a great deal of autonomy from decision makers, they are very much subject to uh, the logic of a market economy of education, meaning that they sometimes understandably are unable to prioritize the needs of society as a whole. I go into these problems listed here more fully in the um, in the report, but right now it has to suffi suffice to say that research is pretty much in agreement of that this strategy of university autonomy is failing in terms of widening participation. So, even though the number of higher education graduates are still rising slowly, higher education is more than ever a matter of social class. Higher education is subject to what research calls vertical stratification. If you want to be provocative, you could say that we now have two universities. Um, one for the elite and one for the masses. Uh, but it's not, to be honest, it's not quite as simple as that, but instead rather complex. Uh, this image perhaps better represents that complexity. Without going into details, what the diagram shows is that students, triangles, are distributed over programs in, institu in institutions, which is the circles here, um, according to gender and parents' profession. What determines education is thus not talent and disposition, but rather inherited social capital. It is perhaps not surprising, therefore, that researchers have found that the IQ of high status professionals has been decreasing over the years, at the same time as their status and economic power has increased. The system simply fails to put the right person in the right place. But not only is higher education vertically stratified, so that students from underrepresented groups rarely enter high status education. But when they do enter such a life path, they often pay a high price emotionally and socially for making that class journey. Even though under underrepresented groups may achieve as well as privileged students academically, they're often less successful socially. This means that they don't have the same networks as privileged students. And once they graduate, they will not get the same payoff. Even with the same degree, a student from a less privileged background will on average have significantly lower and more uncertain lifetime wage than a graduate with a privileged background. What then to do about all this? Well, uh, how to widen participation in a way that both satisfy the utilitarian need for qualified labor and the egalitarian imperatives of democracy. The task given to me by the International Youth Conference 2022 was to look at career guidance and what potentially can have for addressing problems of equity. This means moving the focus away from universities towards the students, that is from sort of from the supply side of education to the demand side. Firstly, what my overview shows is that there is regrettably somewhat a lack of systematic and conclusive research on the specific effects of career guidance towards uh, widening participation. So this is clearly a field where we need more knowledge. However, some conclusions can still be drawn from the research there is. Local studies show, and this is convincingly supported by theoretical models, that even rather limited efforts of career guidance can have substantial benefits to widening participation. Some of these benefits are increased enrollment rates, that is getting more students to enter university by way of the sheer numbers, an increased ratio of underrepresented groups making the underrepresented less so. Decreased mismatching, that is decreasing the number of highly talented students uh, from underrepresented groups that fail to apply to challenging education programs. Increased retainment, meaning that students who make well-informed choices turn out to be on average more happy with their choice and thus more likely to complete their studies. However, Though detailed research is needed, as I said, these outcomes are likely very much dependent on the quality of the career guidance provided, obviously. 
Finally then, extrapolating somewhat from the research we reviewed, I would like to propose an outline of what I believe is required if career guidance is to be successful in contributing to widening participation. A resilient overall strategy is needed to provide equal distribution. Oh, we lost the feed. Uh, not sure what happened there. I'll keep speaking anyway, uh, because the, my words are more important than the slide, I assure you. A resilient overall strategy is needed at, uh, that provides equal distribution of career guidance efforts. Research shows that career guidance is often very much a lottery. You might get some or you might get none. If career guidance is unequally distributed geographically and over social groups, it may of course worsen inequalities rather than improve upon them, which is the idea. At the most basic level, Career counselors will need to be able to help students with all practical matters, applications, funding, accommodation, etc. Things that come easy to someone from a privileged background might be challenging to underrepresented groups. But career counselors also need an awareness about the challenges of equity in education and a clear goal of improving it. Historically, career guidance have a sort of common sense approach to helping the individual finding a suitable future career. In a way, this is reasonable. Helping the individual should be the main task. But without knowledge of the powerful forces involved and a determined effort to cha challenge those forces, there is a risk of simply reproducing the status quo which research often have found career guidance guilty of. By extension, <laughs> by extension, this means uh, that we also need to help the students themselves to develop a critical perspective on their position in life. Who are they? From where have they come? Where are they going? What are the costs of change? What are the benefits? This means not only helping underrepresented groups to overcome obstacles, but also perhaps helping overrepresented groups to consider the less obvious career options that might be more beneficial to them. Not everyone can become a lawyer or a doctor. Greater, greater diversity and equity will therefore mean that some lawyers' sons and doctors' daughters will need to become bakers and librarians, if that is where they best can thrive. What is needed, in summary, is a career guidance service that both empowers students in a critical way to make informed choices and, in a very practical way, enables them to follow through on those aspirations. And with that, I thank you for your attention and uh, give the word back to Urban. Thank you, Eric. And uh, sorry for the technical uh, problems. And to the online audience, we're very, very sorry that we were late in discovering that the audio didn't, didn't work. But uh, as far as I know, it should work now. So very sorry about that. Anyway, we will have to move on. And uh, what I didn't say when I started at all, please take some notes when you he hear the presentations, because you may have questions by the end of, of the seminar. So. Now, I'm welcoming Hardev Singh Greval, who is uh, a youth fellow of the International Youth Think Tank. That is, he has been part of producing what we are doing in the Think Tank. And you have been traveling from, from the UK, from London, today, to be here to do a presentation. And um, it will be a presentation of what, uh, yeah, you will present your <laughs> presentation. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much. So I'm Hardev, a youth fellow, and I attended the International Youth Think Tank Conference in November 2020. So I'll start with, yeah, a bit of background. So this is to present some youth. We put out a survey um, to the youth panel, and that currently, Do you want to go back sorry, to yeah, oh, sorry. sorry, yeah, one minute. Perfect. So to provide a bit of background, this survey was to explore young people's opinions on both democracy, but also how to widen participation in higher education. So the format was four yes or no answer questions as being accompanied with an area for expansion and written responses. 
So some demographics, um, to put this into context, the International Youth Think Tank Youth Panel, comprised of 191 young people from both Europe as well as around the globe, um, despite not all of the young people participating with the survey, uh, those, those who did, 97% of respondents were between the ages of 18 and 28, and the gender distribution was 57% female and 43% male. And just ahead of getting into everything in detail, I think it's worth noting that alongside the quantitative responses and the, the, the summary that we have, the qualitative and written responses are equally and if not more valuable than, than the, the numbers alone. So to start with, uh, discussing the link between politics and higher education. So there was an overwhelming majority, 94.6% agreed that there was a link between both democracy and the participation in higher education. So some things that were identified as that important um, were the diversity in voices. By having people coming from different backgrounds, potentially non-traditional backgrounds, it can add to the richness of discussions and the value that can be taken away from both discussions within higher education, but it can also support us in enabling more and more people from alternative backgrounds or less traditional backgrounds to participate in political discussions and directly influence policy and decision making. It was also discussed that by enabling participation in higher education, it can result in political democratic discourse that is more diverse and varied, something that currently may be lacking in some, if not all countries in Europe and beyond. So there was also discussions that academia and professionalization can result in continued social discourse that primarily favors particular higher social classes, people who may have previously had experience with higher education, um, and it is a class instrument that also reinforces current social classes, hierarchies, and therefore does not allow or acts as a barrier to social mobility. Higher, higher education, whilst this is, it was, un, it, the, it, sorry, it's arguable that higher education doesn't necessarily uh, equip you with all of the skills, or it's not the only means to acquire the skills necessary to participate in political discussions. It was a way for people to develop necessary critical thinking. And regardless of whether it's the only path, it's important that everyone has an equal access or opportunity to make use of that opportunity. So moving on um, and getting a bit more into depth. Uh, so this came from primarily the implicit, um, the implicit, implicit kind of written responses that we received. People who identified key barriers to higher education, widening participation in that, as well as political discourse and discussions. So it's really important to identify intersectional and intergenerational influences on participation. So currently, there are conditions that can accompany those who don't come from traditional academic family backgrounds. That can be language barriers, meaning they may not be able to get support with CV, cover letters, applications, or completing academic essays. There's a lack of suitable personal and professional network, which means that they're not always aware of the opportunities available to them, and they may not have the means to access opportunities that they may well be qualified or overqualified for. Alongside that, it's important to note the poor economic conditions, which can both limit access to opportunity, as well as have an impact on both the mental and emotional well-being of students. So alongside this, it's not just viewing widening participation in higher education or widening access, it's rather acknowledging the enabling and disabling factors that influence one's ability to both influence and participate in higher education, decision-making and policy-making practices. And this leads us on to a really important question which I think is worth asking, how truly democratic can our political practices be if we're not hearing from as many voices that exist in our social realms, um, and we're not hearing a, divi a diverse range of voices. So two questions pertained to the role of career guidance in widening participation. As you can see from question two, over half of respondents had not received careers guidance within high school or educational institution. And of those who had in their written feedback, it was highlighted and emphasized that they didn't necessarily derive as much value as you might be believed from receiving guidance. Question four, 
also shows that many respondents, despite current conditions, believe that careers guidance is an invaluable tool to not only widen participation in higher education, but also make people more aware of their possibilities beyond higher education and their academic career. So students would not only be better informed of their options, but would also be more capable of gaining a broader perspective on their desired career or careers. So it's really important to note here that through this, it's not only acknowledging the educational institution and the role that that plays in career guidance, but also the role of the family. If someone has come from a higher education, a background or an academic background, they're likely to have wider networks that may offer more benefit when researching the careers and the kind of future life paths that they wish to take, and they be more, may be more aware to be able to access those skills. Um, so for some who answered no to whether it's kind of mandatory, it wasn't necessarily that they disagreed with the idea that guidance would be invaluable and beneficial and help address widening participation, but rather it should be, it should be widespread, but not necessarily compulsory. So here are some summary findings. So I think it's important to note that there's an intricate link between social mobility, access to higher education, and participation in democratic political practices. And it's integral to, uh, to, uh, for us to take an intersectional approach, a person-centered approach that accounts for not only various aspects of their identity and lived experience, but also the intergenerational aspects, the benefits and detriments that can be experienced coming from a background, an academic family background, or ones who don't. Um, it's also integral to widening participation in higher education um, that we need to not only increase the access to higher education, but also enable those people to develop the skill sets and have the opportunities to engage in political discussions, similar to myself in the International Youth Think Tank Conference. The benefits of political systems, as well as the extent to which they're truly democratic, are arguably stunted, not only, due, not only down to persistent class divides, but also the voices, perspectives, and lived experience of those who are less privileged, being underrepresented in public arenas and forums, whether that's traditional political spheres or not. So through better career guidance provisions, we can not only better inform young people of their academic options, but also help prepare and equip them with the skill sets necessary to access and participate in higher education, um, as well as hopefully make democracies more equitable and representative. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deb, for this presentation. Now we will have the third presentation, and that will be made uh, online, and uh, we will have some help with the technicians, because the next presenter is Call his, his name is Mattes Rauch. He's a German uh, youth fellow of the think tank, and he has been one of the author uh, writing a policy brief, mm -hmm. which means a very pointed uh, proposal on how to change the uh, current way of guiding in high schools. So the mandatory career support services at all EU high schools is the title of this policy brief that Mathis now will present to you. So, Mathis, so happy to see you here, and the floor is all yours, and you have nine minutes to go to present the policy brief. Welcome. Thank you, Oban. Um, yeah, good afternoon to everyone. My name is Mathis. I'm uh, a youth fellow of the International Youth Think Tank, and I participated in the uh, International Youth Conference 2021, uh, from which this policy proposal also originates. High schools are the most socioeconomically diverse space in mandatory high educa in mandatory uh, education systems, and those the most effective space to um, target and to start implementing democracy strengthening proposals in the area of education. And this policy proposal on mandatory career support services or CSS at all European uh, high schools aims to democratize the access to higher education by offering a comprehensive service based on advice and help practical support, and integration into the higher education system. I'll now dive deeper into what this means, but first of all, I'll um, yeah, kind of contextualize the problem. So why do we actually need this uh, policy proposal? Currently, uh, in the European Union and beyond, there is a huge gap in access to higher education, as uh, Eric and other speakers have, have mentioned before. 
And this, this gap is particularly disadvantages uh, students from non-academic and socioeconomically marginalized backgrounds. And there are actually studies that show that low income negatively affects um, people's transition into higher education and leader leadership positions. And the lacking diverse uh, representation in leadership positions leads to a neglect of certain demographics in decision making and policy making. And this is an inherently uh, democratic issue. So the, the, uh, the status quo uh, is actually, unfortunately, that there's uh, inequity in the access to secondary education. And uh, yeah, as I've outlined, it's, it's also an inherently democratic issue. So it's of wider uh, social importance. What CSS um, actually tries to do is to be a tangible solution to the European Union's policy goal on widening participation. So CSS aims to overcome def the, the deficits that I've just outlined across the European higher educational area or the EHEA. Education and universities function as uh, sort of passports um, to status, financial security and e social, economic and uh, political power. And this uh, is also recognized by the European Union, which has defined the policy goal of increasing um, widening participation within the EHEA. And the aim is particularly defined as uh, um, achieving 45% of tertiary education attained among 25 and 34 year olds by 2030. And as Eric mentioned before, um, the European Union has uh, defined the goal, but what actually happens in practice is still uh, a bit vague and up to universities and other education institutions themselves. So through the uh, mandatory uh, career, career support services, we aim to offer a tangible solution to actually achieve this uh, policy goal of the European Union. Now, how does this actually work in practice? So how do you want to implement it? Um, and this is where, where it comes to the schematic solution. So we aim to implement it through a three-phase API system. So A stands for advice and help, and uh, it should guide students in the orientation phase, which we have defined as the last three years of high school education. And throughout these years, students should have mandatory one-on-one -on -one meetings every semester with uh, the career um, support services. They can also schedule additional uh, additional meetings, but this should be the minimum mandatory um, uh, meetings. And we've made them mandatory because if they're not mandatory, they tend to be um, used by, uh, by students from certain backgrounds more often than students from marginalized backgrounds, as uh, Eric mentioned before. And uh, the aim of these, uh, of these meetings is to introduce students to different career paths and opportunities. Uh, so to just lay out what kind of array of opportunities uh, is, is out there as uh, knowledge uh, about these uh, opportunities is per the first uh, important thing in order to uh, aspire to, to actually reach them. Um, and another important aspect is economic risk assessment. As Eric has outlined in his, uh, in his research paper, that uh, for many people, especially from uh, socioeconomically mar marginalized backgrounds, uh, higher education is sometimes not uh, seen as a liable opportunity uh, because of the economic risks that come, come with it. If you study for three to five years and you don't have an income, you, you have to afford even, even this and you don't even know in the future whether it pays off. And as Eric has mentioned as well, even the same degree pays off differently for students uh, depending on their socioeconomic uh, background. So in that sense, uh, in, uh, to that extent, the, the economic risk assessment is, is very important for students from certain backgrounds to actually make a, make a decision on which, which study program they may, may want to pursue. And um, in line with this is uh, outlining certain prerequisites and necessary documents in order to pursue the, the path of interest. So to, to become a bit more practical. And, uh, and detailed in what, what's actually needed to um, be being el eligible for this certain um, path. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing that should be mentioned is that the, the career support service should advise on additional extracurricular learning materials and activities, because it's also shown by research that students that lack uh, certain extracurricular activities are also um, less likely to join higher education. Um, and now we're coming to, to the second phase, which uh, is the practical support during the application phase. So the first phase was more about outlining what opportunities are out there, what um, are kind of the prospects and the, the documents um, that are needed to, um, to uh, access these, uh, 
these opportunities. And the second phase is a bit more practical. So it's uh, usually during the last year of, uh, of high school when it comes towards the application. And that's where the um, TSS should step in to assist and guide students during the application process. Um, so first of all, to outline necessarily application documents and how to acquire them. And uh, secondly, to assist very practically in things like uh, CV and cover letter writing, because I can also say from uh, from my personal uh, background, and that's also what Eric mentioned before, currently it's kind of, um, yeah, it, it highly depends on which high school you are, depending on which, uh, which access you have to career support services. At some high schools, it's very, uh, it's very strong, at others less. And uh, especially at high schools such as uh, international um, schools, which tend to be um, attended by people from a from a higher socioeconomic background, these support services tend to be stronger than in other other high schools. So um, actually, right now, further um, uh, further strengthening the gap that I've mentioned before. And another addition that we found very important is to uh, link these students to a student mentorship program for peer to peer support. So the students in high school should be linked to students in universities, which actually have lived experience of um, yeah, applying to the same university and may, may give uh, tips to the student in high school on, on uh, what, first of all, what, what is it like to be at this institution? How is the certain study program? But also giving tips on, uh, on application. And thirdly, um, the integration assistant during the realization phase because there are many bureaucratic and financial hur hurdles to access higher education despite acceptance. So there are uh, many students out there, um, and I know, I know many, of my, uh, um, many friends, from, especially from abroad, who face this issue. They have been accepted to a higher education um, institution, but still weren't able to, to actually realize the stream and to, to access it, this education due to bureaucratic and financial hurdles. So um, that's that's often a point that's uh, that's not included in nowadays uh, support services. So there are some support services that outline the opportunities of different careers, but there are not many that actually help in the application uh, process, let alone in the realization phase. So um, in this phase, it's very important to support the student in bureaucratic and financial support, uh, for example, to find housing, scholarship opportunities, um, among others and to continue the mentorship uh, program with uh, the peer to peer mentorship program with the other students because they as i mentioned before have been in the same situation and uh, probably know uh, some opportunities regarding scholarships or especially housing and uh, another point is also to uh, which is very important to mention is that obviously an application can be unsuc unsuc uh, unsuccessful so what happens if a student was not able to reach uh, the um, desired uh, career in that case, they should schedule another meeting with the career support service to discuss alternative uh, opportunities, uh, let it be um, in, in education or um, other career path. And I also want to point out that this whole idea of the mandatory career support uh, services does not aim to push everyone into higher, uh, into, into higher education because um, we don't need 100% in higher education and maybe some people don't don't want to have uh, or don't want to follow a, a university uh, path. That's also fine, but it aims to uh, democratize and to um, make the access more equitable to to these institutions. And uh, a very important point that I find uh, super important is that students should also have access to the career support services even after graduation, because uh, some people, among myself, uh, may pursue uh, gap years for one or two years. And uh, it would be unfair that those students would not have access to the career guidance just because they need it one or two years later. And there may also be the opportunity um, to ask for career guidance maybe after your first degree um, or to, um, to pursue another or a different um, higher education degree. And in this uh, sense, the API system really tries to make uh, the CSS a long-term and sustainable su support service for students and uh, now you may think it's 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 a nice idea, but uh, is it actually is it actually practical? Should is it is it really um, worth implementing or, or successful? And here would uh, strongly say yes, because there is um, evidence of a similar model called the Widening Participation Units or WPC from Northern Ireland, which has been implemented in 2010, and it's um, it's a model which. Uh, 
of university unit, units that reach out to marginalized or particularly target marginalized student groups and high schools with marginalized uh, student groups. Um, and they organize visits and orientation days, among others, at universities. And after a few years, um, this, this uh, program, this model has really been successful as um, now at 50%, Northern Ireland now has the highest secondary education participation rate in the United Kingdom. So the mandatory career support service tries to build up on the proven success of this model, but I would say even offers a more comprehensive approach by um, um, outlining the API system that I just mentioned before, and also by starting at the high schools. So the WPC is actually um, begins with universities that target um, uh, high schools, which is very important, but I, I would argue that it's even more important to uh, implement these programs at a high school level because that's where we have uh, the most uh, socioeconomic uh, diverse student background. And uh, secondly, if it's up to the universities, there may be only certain universities that are doing it and other universities that are not doing it. But by making it mandatory on all uh, high schools, you really make sure that literally every student in the European Union is targeted and has access first of all, to the mandatory career support guidance, and secondly, um, is able to uh, equitably or at least more equitably access higher education. And secondly, it's also what has been mentioned before, so I wanted to use panel data, so um, which, is, uh, which comes from a diverse body of, of students consisting of 100 youth from all over the European Union and 32 countries, and from varying backgrounds, so varying uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, which makes it particularly interesting for this policy proposal. And they give uh, critical and constructive feedback to the IYTT and uh, project that we're working on. And they are saying that, uh, for good reason, democracy and higher education are pr profoundly intertwined, and uh, a stunning number of almost 95% actually answered yes to the question, um, do you think that it's important for democracy to increase participation in higher education for individuals from non-academic family backgrounds? And I think uh, this is this is very telling that uh, the policy proposal that uh, I'm proposing right now, among other other youth fellows, uh, is, is very much demanded by students themselves as well. And uh, to round it up, um, yeah, we believe that the CSS is strengthening democracy through education in uh, for at least four different levels, which are education, knowledge creation, leadership, and decision making. First of all, uh, education is democratized by uh, yeah, enabling a more equitable access to higher education. And secondly, a very interesting point is that I would argue that knowledge creation is also democratized by diversifying the student body in the higher education system. Different students from different backgrounds and different experiences will be literally brought into the classroom, into discussions, and uh, yeah, enable uh, new, more diverse discussions, and those also uh, more diverse knowledge creation, which is very, very valuable for students from all different backgrounds, uh, but also for, for um, in terms of democracy, economics, and politics for whole, for whole country. And thirdly, which makes a lot of sense, is that the lead through a more diversified graduation, uh, a gra graduate body at higher education, in the long term, we will very likely see a more diversified uh, leadership as well. And uh, this, vice versa in the long term, um, will make it more likely that decision and policy making takes increasingly um, people from different backgrounds into account, which is uh, very, very important, obviously, for uh, in, in democratic terms, as I've outlined in the beginning. So uh, yeah, to, to round it up in the last sentence, I would say that uh, the mandatory career support services at all European high schools would strengthen democracy in at least four different levels through education. And I'm um, looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. So now we have four commentators that I welcome up uh, on the floor. Uh, and I will present them one at a time. And they have been giving it, a, giving it the task of reflecting a bit on, on the different presentation. And the first uh, commentator is Ulf Dahlnes. Ulf is the Vice Dean for Collaboration uh, at the Artistic Faculty at the University of Gothenburg. Please, Ulf. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, great work. I really appreciate what you did here. And I think what you did was to uh, lift up an important function within every educational system in a way the function that compensates for a poor background. 
And I think that could be a game changer. So thank you for that. But I have a few remarks. One is, isn't it too late at secondary school? For example, in the Netherlands, you choose the path for higher education when you are about 12 years old. And in Sweden, it's the opposite. You can have all ways to higher education. It never ends. It's lifelong and it's for free and all that. But it doesn't matter. We have the same problem with uh, narrow recruitment. So I think the career support should start in early childhood, even maybe in kindergarten. I think that's crucial. Um, the other thing I wonder is how career support should reach the kids we really need to reach. Um, boys with two Swedish parents from the countryside, to mention one of the most uh, excluded group in Sweden. I, I, that's a culture aspect that, I, that uh, goes very deep in these issues. And I'm, I'm not sure that career support could solve this cr uh, culture issue. So this was my only remarks, really. But again, your suggestion will be one way to open up higher education, not for all, but for more in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Ulf. Uh, Mikael Grober. Uh, Mikael is the director of studies and the deputy head of the department uh, with education responsibility. And this is at the School of Architecture at Umeå University. Mikael, the floor is all yours. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, what an honor to be on the same floor as you youth fellows. And thank you for the invitation. Uh, so I represent uh, those who are quite heavily also criticized in the report. Uh, us who are responsible of working with, with uh, participation and also uh, promoting our, our education so that we have uh, more students from various back backgrounds coming in. And from that perspective, it's almost a bit embarrassing what I have accomplished, considering what you have accomplished in such a short time. Um, I do have some things that I would like to, to highlight, which I th think was, uh, which I really enjoyed reading. And one, one was that you uh, pointed out the possible conflict of excellence and inclusion, which I think is, is, is uh, something that I uh, come across all the time. We want to promote and uh, we want to reward uh, excellent students. And how do we do that and, and be inclusive at the same time? And what happens to those students who are not rewarded uh, and who are not promoted and who, who are not pointed out to being excellent? Uh, uh, you discussed that, and I think that you, that you pointed that out is, is, a, is an important thing. Uh, another, another such possible conflict that you point out is that of the wishes and needs of society and that of the individual. Uh, and uh, how education is not just for you know, meeting societal needs, but also for uh, letting uh, young people uh, do what they want and thrive in that uh, and become greater humans, if you like. Um, I have two comments, and one was almost stolen by Ulf, actually. I also think that maybe it's too late to start in, in, in secondary uh, level. Uh, but I think it has to do with, with uh, making the informed choice. There is a beautiful quote. Uh, uh, to know what I want to be, I must know what I am. And I think that journey to, to, to learn what you are needs to start really early in education. And, and the students need to be promoted and, and given the opportunities very early on. Um, and then a last thing that, I, that, that, I, that also is kind of an ad, and that is that what I say to my coworkers is do whatever it takes to keep the students. Uh, and I totally agree. Of course, we should, uh, we should advise them perhaps not to stay in higher education if that's not their thing. But uh, the economic uh, uh, um, uh, incentives to do so, I mean, only a handful of architect students are close to a full-time uh, uh, teaching position. So, so what are the incentives to, to, to really do that and to work like that? 
Um, I also want to say that this whole process is to me a beautiful kind of, it, it, it shows the whole uh, process and the model of the IYTT in action. Uh, mobilizing youth, promoting democracy, developing uh, proposals and influencing those uh, who are working in, with these issues. This is exactly what's happening here and now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikael. Mimi Håkansson is International Administrative Officer at the International Center of the University of Gothenburg. Welcome, Mimi. Thank you, and uh, I've been part of the, the IYTT before, so I'm happy that to be invited again. Um, I, my first comment is just that I think it's, you really lift an important issue about the career guidance, and I think it's very important. Uh, my, my first um, thing I want to highlight is, I also think that this is also important to continue in offering at the university in the higher education. Um, being able to, to prevent students from to drop out, that they continue to study if they wish so, of course. Um, and there are study, all the different departments at the university have study counselors, but not all of them have career guidance, for example. As far as I know, there's only a career service here at this School of um, Economics and Law Business. And I think that we should think about maybe re-establishing um, a university-wide, or at least so every student have the accessibility to, to it. Um, also, I need to think that we should, um, the university also need to be better to uh, collaborate between the study support office, uh, the academic writing and language support, so the students really have the support that they need. Um, another comment I want like to make is also um, when we talk about diversity. Diversity uh, is very important, of course, but sometimes we tend to mix up uh, diversity and inclusion. Just because we are a diverse unit, diversity doesn't mean that we're automatically inclusive. Uh, and I think that this is also something we need to, to look into, not just recruit students, but also th that the students feel like they belong and they want to continue and feel like, um, yeah, they belong in the education system. Um, so things like, the, um, yeah, uh, look into the curricula, um, decolonize the curricula, which course literature do we use, from which uh, researchers, things like that. I think this is also a very important issue when it comes to inclusion. Um, my last remark is that I think we should also collaborate more with civil society and with high schools, with career guidance, that's so that the university and, and higher education also collaborate with uh, the career guidance that should be offered in this, um, in this position. Uh, so, uh, I would also like to say that there is a good uh, project right now called Street Games Academy, where uh, it's a project between GU, Chalmers, and the uh, Västergötaland region, and the sport associations where volunteers, students that study at Gothenburg University and Chalmers, uh, they um, help children uh, with homework. And I think this is a good initiative, and I think we need more projects like this. So, thank you. Thank you, Mimi. So, Marlin Persson, welcome Marlin. Marlin is a board professional with a background in global business with a focus on research, innovation and strategy. And you were also a member of the IYTT reference group. I'm so happy to have you here, Marlin. For is all yours. Likewise, and thank you so much. And I think we should always start with being part of the IYTT reference group. That's the most important. Um, uh, thank you, and I think I think it's, uh, it's given that this is a very, very good proposal. It's a very important proposal even. Um, coming from my background, obviously I want to also look upon this proposal from perhaps another angle, from more of a business society perspective. And um, I think it's important, and now I also know that you're not saying that this is a proposal based on on equality. This is not about fairness. This is about business and prosperity. And I think that's really, to me, that's the foundation. Then we are happy about the other consequences as well. But this is to increase democracy. This is to improve business and prosperity of society. 
Uh, and, and going back one step, I think if we all can agree that diversity and inclusion, thank you, drives innovation and by that prosperity, then this proposal is even more important. And I also think that all of us can agree that if you are educated, if you are able to make informed choices, then you make better choices. And that's the other part of, of the proposal. So I think it's important to recognize that this uh, proposal will make higher education environment more complex because it will be more complex if we are more diverse uh, in the playing field. It might even be more cumbersome and that is good because that will drive new ideas. But I think it's important to understand that both for students and for teachers, lecturers, it will be harder with, with a, a more diverse mix. And uh, that is something that we should embrace and, and welcome, obviously. Um, I also think that, and, and that was said in the presentation, that the mandatory career support services are not only for the minorities, it's also for, for everyone. And I really like that part for many different reasons, which we could come back to. Uh, but I think it's, it's needed both from the less privileged, the minorities, but also from the ones who are not making informed choices, but just following a path that is drawn from, from someone else. I have not been looking into financing of the proposal, and of course, but I'm, I'm sure, coming from business, I know that there will be also monetary payback on this, so I'm not worried uh, for, uh, for that to be sorted out. One additional comment is exactly what was said before, uh, that we all know that the first choices a girl or a boy or anyone, a child makes, you do that, you make your choices when you are 10 or 12. So we need to start earlier, but that shouldn't hinder us to do this at, at high school level. So I'm very happy to, s to see that this proposal also includes uh, support after graduation, but also in between during a gap year, uh, as an example. Um, so all in all, uh, this means to me that this proposal is not mainly about increasing participation of disadvantaged groups, but to enable a better mix, which in turn will lead to increased prosperity and, and democracy. So thank you so much for devoting your time into this, and we will do whatever it takes to get it further. Thank you, Molly. So, uh, all the panelists, please come up to the tables, and Dev and Eric, please come up to me here, because now we are open up for, for comments and questions from, from the audience, and it means you in the room, and it means you who are online. Who want to start? Yes. from university to begin with, because I see the financing part as being one of the bigger problems uh, if you want to include every high school within the European Union or many of them. Uh, is there any sort of like EU uh, program or anything coming up on an EU level? Maybe you that uh, has written the master's thesis knows a bit more about this. I could try to answer the question. Uh, I haven't written a master's thesis about this. This is uh, just um, a research overview done for the IYTT. But um, I think that there is a very, very strong, um, a strong direction in, in the leadership of, the, of Europe to, to address these matters. But it's still lacking a sort of, um, sort of concrete strategy and that's why I think this is a very good time to make these kind of proposals because what is needed now is concrete proposals how to do it and maybe that answers your question a little bit yeah. anyone else who want to comment on the cost side of this yeah, because Okay, my name is Per Östling and I'm working together with the universities here in Gothenburg to do the projects yeah, regarding this. And actually last summer we discovered, for example, in Jordan and many other countries in the world, there is a mandatory for the university students to actually do a couple of hours 
uh, out in society to promote higher education before they get their diplomas. So that is a way to solve this issue without any external costs, actually. If I may, Urban, I, I think it's, it's also important, and that's a, that's a really good suggestion, and I, and I think it's important that the foundation is there to also find a, a decided scheme for this support so that it will be balanced so that you will get the same kind of support and insight whether you are in France or in, in um, Croatia. Uh, thank you so much. Very <coughs> so <coughs> sorry. So many interesting things. Just adding on to that sort of European perspective. Uh, I, I mean, these questions are really at the high end of uh, the new strategy for European universities that the Commission presented just about a year ago, and also uh, intricate parts of what you would call the European University Initiative. So there are forming you know, European University alliances all over Europe. There are 44 right now. University of Gothenburg is part of one called Utopia. And so I think that also the sort of cooperation between different European universities doing lots of things in this regard together is might be a key also to sort of strengthen the common European muscle in some respects. So I think there's a lot of things going on. So I think this, of course, initiatives goes well with what, what is being sort of brought to the table on the European level just to add some perspective. Thank you, this was very interesting. I wanted to ask mainly the two youth fellows, I think, uh, because obviously this goes a little bit outside the, the, the core of your proposal, which I really like. But one way of, of facilitating for non-privileged group to access higher education is, of course, financing. So have you looked at the relation between um, having access to, to cheap loans, like, like in Sweden, or, or scholarships, or, or other types of financing, which is, of course, an incentive for those who do not come from an academic background or have, have the means, uh, because this obviously would, would be very much related, uh, the, the economic possibilities to choose your career, uh, not only your sort of, you know, your, your, your spontaneous uh, ability to choose it, but you have to link it with the economic uh, pillar as well. Have you looked at this, you or, or Mathis, if you're still there? <laughs> I, so I can speak first. So in terms of the formal proposals, um, I'm not too familiar with this, but being aware of kind of uh, London and how financing works there, I think that firstly, the availability of scholarships does hugely incentivize people to firstly apply because even so I went to a state school background, very diverse kind of high school background, and a lot of people were put off with the idea that, so in the UK it functions very differently to, to Europe. Um, so I have left university with a 70,000 pound debt, um, and in within 10 years that will be close to 250,000 pounds, and it's constantly increasing, and many people will be put off, and it's about how you conceptualize it. Um, and I think that feeds into thinking about the types of subjects that you might study, uh, talking about the payout and economically the, the job role that you can get, the pay that you can receive after graduating. And unfortunately, there is a difference between those who are more privileged and those who aren't, even if the grade and performance are the same. So in terms of actual numbers or facts, I don't have it um, currently, but I think that the economic aspect is one, one aspect within a broader kind of system um, just like we as individuals work within a s complex system of moving parts. Um, I think the financing and some scholarships being available can help, but there are many people who, despite the economic repercussions, will ch still choose to take up that opportunity of attending higher education for not only the academic skills that you can develop and the experience of attending a university or any kind of higher education institution, but more so the, the personal development that you experience. So I think it's, it's multifaceted, so the economic aspect is worth analyzing, exploring, um, and thinking about, and I think it would be great to increase financial support where possible, but there are many other steps in the interim to widen participation until we can get to kind of the end goal that we, we hope for. Yeah. Thank you, Deb. Yeah, maybe you can, sorry, can you hear me still? Yes, Matthias. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can add some comments as well. I mean, first of all, as has been mentioned before, the context really depends because me coming from Germany, it's a totally different context uh, than the UK, for example, when it comes to scholarships. 
Um, first of all, what we've looked into is that uh, the main hindrance regarding scholarships is not necessarily applying for them and, uh, and, and getting them, but also the bureaucratic hurdles that you have to go through in order to, uh, to um, acquire them. And uh, there as well to have, to have uh, a lack of support in order to, to go through these hurdles, because it's often for many, for many students the first time they have to go through kind of this kind of uh, bureaucratic um, system. And regarding the financing thing for the whole proposal, I would uh, invite you all to read uh, Eric's um, research paper, because uh, luckily I'm online, so I could just uh, search it pretty quickly. Um, in chapter 4.2 on the case for guidance, uh, it says that in a 2019 um, Swedish government committee report on career guidance, economists uh, perform the thought experiment that if a career counselor spent 10 hours each with 240 students, it would only require that one of them was guided to the right career path and safe from long-term unemployment for the investment to pay off. And I think this is a very strong case that says, of course, we need initial investment to make career guidance mandatory at all European high schools and to have a career counselor at each European high school. And uh, maybe I've not uh, said that clear enough before, uh, the career cloud counselor should be in the same building as the high school, actually. Um, and if that pays off, if you just need one out of 240 students um, to, uh, yeah, to have a higher, uh, say, uh, socioeconomic uh, future than uh, expected otherwise, then I think uh, maybe, maybe I make it too easy, but I think that's already a big, a big answer to the, to the long-term finance question of this, this report. And I'm not sure if we still have no. time to respond to no. the other, to the other are, comments that have been made. Sorry, Mattis, we are up. Uh... It's one o'clock, uh, actually two minutes past. So thank you for, for filling in this very important thing about the cost side of, of career guidance. And uh, uh, thank you, Erik and Deb, for your presentations. Mali, Mimi, Ulf, Mikkel, thank you for coming as commentators. And the audience in the room, thank you so much for coming here. And the audience online, we are so sorry that you were lacking the audio, audio from the start of the presentation. We hope to be better the next time. And to all of you, we are organizing more Gothenburg Democracy Talks. So if you are curious about what we are doing, go to the web page and register, and you will have continuously invitations to our Gothenburg Democracy Talks and other events. And otherwise, there is a copy of the report that you could grab when you leave the room. And have a nice Friday afternoon and a nice weekend. Bye. <laughs>